Good morning. Welcome to the programme. We have a lot to talk about this morning. Uh, this is Bloomberg Markets today. We've got breaking news coming through from the corporate sector. We'll weigh that up. We'll ask questions around whether corporate earnings are good enough to offset what we're seeing uh, in the, uh, the macro story around interest rates and interest rate cut expectations. Uh, plenty to talk about then when it comes to the corporate earnings story. Uh, we're also, of course, focused on EU politics. We'll bring all of that to you shortly. Markets Today starts right now. morning. Thursday the 18th, we've got a lot to talk about. TSMC numbers dropping within the last half hour. Remember, the chip sectors had a pretty bad uh, run over the last few days. In fact, NVIDIA, you could argue, down 10%, is now in a correction process. So is the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index. We should probably talk about some of the corporate earnings that are going to be dropping as well. Good morning, everybody. It is a busy morning. Let's mm. start with TSMC and figure out what is happening there. So I'm kind of seeing this in the context of what we got yesterday from ASML. ASML is kind of pointing us towards maybe weak demand coming out of Asia, weak demand coming out of Taiwan. That's not in some ways being reflected in the numbers that we're seeing this morning from TSMC. No, it's not. And I think what's interesting, though, is that they, even though you have this outperformance in TSMC, this weakness in ASML, there is kind of a lag effect, right? TSMC is really at the whim of this iPhone demand being the only yep. kind of uh, maker of smartphone processors at the whim as well of uh, the ASML kind of lithography machines that are going to end up in some of those TSMC plants. So there's almost a lag that perhaps hasn't shown up in TSMC that ASML was warning about yesterday. OK, well, that's an interesting one to think about, isn't it? it, it which is the most current story? Which is the most up-to-the-minute story? And if right. it's ASML, then we're not too comforted by what we're seeing no. from TSMC today. But it does ask interesting questions about the extent to which the AI boom can offset weakness in other parts of the tech space. That's what we see with TSMC, of course, big supplier yeah. to Apple. But it's not the slowness in Apple demand that's weighing on the business. It's the strength in AI that stands out here. It, it is. And the question now is, does that now rescue some of the stock performances we've seen coming out of the States. So I mentioned NVIDIA has been down quite sharply over the last few days. So it's down in correction territory. It's down by 10%. Uh, it's, it, I think it was 20, for the 25th of last month when we hit a peak. It's since rolled over. So has the semiconductor index. You saw that yesterday as well. Yeah. ASML was a big driver of that. Does this number out of TSMC put a floor under that story for the global chip space right now? And in particular, the high-end performers like NVIDIA? And I think that's what Wall Street's going to be looking at a little bit later when it comes to these numbers. And that's the near-term effect. Anna, you flagged a story this morning about the global effect as mm. well, uh, and specifically in the United States. I think you said there was a grant going to Micron, but the one that caught my eye was the Samsung plant in Texas, actually. A home mm. state of mine. I know, <laughs> and, and they didn't send me to Texas. Uh, but, but this plant that's supposed to be twice the size of the Korean plant as well, um, and, and Gina Raimondo on, on, the, um, on the ground there in Texas talking about this expansion that, again, isn't going to materialize for... Yeah. Until the end of the decade. There are so many fascinating angles on this, on this story around the U.S. putting more money, more government money behind yep. chips in the United States to bring these home. Just on the Micron story, so you were talking about Samsung there, but just on the Micron story, $6 billion, four factories being planned for New York State and one in Idaho. This is just one company and what they're planning to do. I was really struck by some comments from the CEO recently, this is on, uh, of Micron, saying that to make this happen, they need sufficient uh, grants, investment tax credits, local incentives to address the cost differences with overseas. So that's where we are now on this industry. These companies want the, the cost differences with, the, with producing in emerging markets completely offset by governments. This interventionist industrial policy is the new reality. It, it is. Taiwan's been doing this for years. Mm. So Taiwan, it's been water. It's been what has been happening in terms of the grants that have been available. It's been land. It's been electricity. Taiwan's been doing this for a long time, which is why it's had this lead. Everybody's now catching up with this idea yeah. and arguing that you have to do it. Now, these companies are putting a lot of money to work here as well. This isn't just government money that is mm. going in. These companies are making a big investment into this stuff. But it's going to be geographically separate. And it's interesting, they're talking about this on the T-Live with TSMC this morning. TSMC has been very good at concentrating what it does in one place, and that's given it advantages. As we start to spread it out, do those advantages dissipate? And do we get a less efficient system, and therefore we get less progress? There is a labor story to all of this as well, yep. in that... You can have as much investment in terms of the physical capacity in the United States or in Europe or wherever. Do you have the labor to match it? I think there were some cost metrics that came out. Bloomberg Intelligence ages ago put it some out that the 
uh, cheaper labor story, of course, on entry-level engineers, for example, the availability and the training you get yep. out of the likes of Taiwan in Asia is completely different to the pay story in the States. You have to mm. have more training in the States. You have to also pay up for that talent. When you get to the mid and more senior levels, then the pay matches. But that entry-level story, especially working at some of these fabs, at some of these plants, does not match up. There's yet. a labor market story. There's an inflation story, of course, attached to all of the fiscal spending yeah. we're seeing coming out of the United States. Um, but, but there were real lessons for Europe, lessons for other oh, yeah. parts of the world in what the U.S. is doing right now on chips. So, so I, I, I've been to a lot of EU summits. They are not the most fascinating things in the world. I've spent a lot of hours <laughs> sort of sitting there waiting for things to happen. This summit, I feel, actually, that's taking Brussels, place in Brussels today, I think is interesting. And I think it's interesting for, for exactly the reasons you lay out. Europe's got some real challenges mm. that it's got to deal with right now. It's got to pay for the green transition. How's it going to do that? Is there going to be joint funding? It's got to pay for weapons. It's got to rearm. How's it going to do that? How is it going to figure out the process that goes around that? Is, and this is a big push right now, is the capital markets union finally going to find a reason to exist? Europe only comes through in a crisis. And We've got a crisis, folks, mm. and it looks like Europe might make some decisions, and these could be quite big decisions. Guys, very animated. I was at this conference. Like, well, I, I'm going to take some of this credit for it. I came back from Brussels. I was like, guys, yeah. everything's <laughs> happening in Brussels right now. It's, um. it's not <laughs> happening. It's happening in all the different kind of places around, around Europe. But, but those differences in those countries are getting smaller. And I, and I think the crisis... You, you go to these summits, and there's no crisis, nothing happens. Yeah. But there, I, you, during the Greek crisis, there was a crisis. Things happened. During COVID, there was a crisis. Mm. Things happened. The Ukraine war is a crisis. Joint debt happened. Exactly. Crucially. Yeah. But you know where I think the, the hiccup is here? We've finally got Germany on the same page, pushing for this, where historically they haven't been on the page. But you don't have all of the EU members no. on mm. board. This is really just the bigger economies, and you need that support from the likes of, I'm going to name a couple of countries here, Luxembourg, the Czech Republic, Cyprus. These are names I've never necessarily read into on a 7 a.m. in the Monday morning, but they could actually get in the way of what is really needed in Europe. And thinking about what is needed, we've got some really interesting um, uh, sound bites from uh, Mario Draghi, formerly of the ECB, of course, yep. but now working on a report around competitiveness. And this takes us back to what we're saying about chips and the amount that the U.S. are doing uh, to, to bring chips home and to incentivize production and to encourage businesses to set up in the United States. Let's listen to what Mario Draghi had to say earlier on this week. China, for example, is aiming to capture and internalize all parts of the supply chain in green and advanced technologies. The United States, for its part, are using large-scale industrial policy to attract high-value domestic manufacturing capacity within their borders. We are lacking a strategy for how to keep pace in an increasing cutthroat race. It requires us to act as a European Union in a way we never have before. OK, perhaps a preview there from Mario Draghi of what he might say, what he might recommend in that competitiveness report. But this just, just goes under, uh, and he went on to underscore what's at stake here, to your point, Guy, about how a crisis is required. He was saying that what is needed in Europe is something as drastic as we saw in the early 1950s when the coal and steel community was first put together. The that, is, plan. that is the level of, 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 of uh, new thinking he thinks is required. Industrial policy. I, that, in some ways, was an industrial policy. I think it was designed, obviously, to deal with the aftermath of the Second World War, the, the coal and steel union that was created and then ultimately led to the EU. But, but it's kind of... That's where everybody else is going at the moment. I, we talked about Micron. We talked about what is happening in Texas. We talk about the industrial policy that is happening in China. Those are all areas that the EU needs to figure out what it's going to do. But I, but I think it's, it's, it's also something else. There is an existential crisis that exists in Europe in some ways with the conflict that is happening in Ukraine. And if that doesn't galvanise kind of action mm. here, I don't know what will. It was interesting, we were listening to the UN here yesterday, but the Saab CEO was on air, mm. and he was talking about the fact that we need to figure out a way of taking the technology, developing it, and then industrialising it. And the moment what we do in Europe is we don't industrialise it, we buy from the Americans. So we develop the technology and then don't do anything with it. We've got to figure out a kind of, kind of start to finish process that allows e the EU to actually take some of this technology yeah. and use it for its own good. Relevant on defence sounds like a number of other industries and the European experience, but, but certainly the defence the defense point well made. Sourcing materials is such a big part of this as well. Yep. And, and the, the timing of this is crucial in terms of that industrialization process. When we eventually get there, does 
Europe broadly even have the capacity to not only do that, but then the access to the materials you need. Think of aluminum, steel, et cetera. Yep. The very materials, by the way, that Russia makes and is the kind of dominant player in. How do you square the two when you're trying to source the materials from that part of the world or find alternatives in other parts of the world while also mm. building the defense to protect against that very country? I don't want to be too down on Europe. Europe's got some great technology. So ASML is one company that, that is kind of pivotal to all of this yeah, process and true. has been developed really strongly. We talk about the kind of the, the core six that we watch in Europe. Schneider Technology is one of those companies that's on that list. It does grid technology. Yeah. It does all the stuff that AI needs right now. Electrification. ABB. Yeah. So Asia Brown Bavaria is out with numbers this morning. Take a look at ABB's charts over, over the last few months. It's up 40% from the October lows. This is a company that people have figured out is really important mm. in new grid technology. It's grid technology um, segments doing really well. The margins are looking really strong. So here is a company that... That you, again, Europe, these are the industrial companies that Europe has the potential to develop. And investors, in some ways, are recognizing this. Yeah, absolutely. And the ABB story, yeah, very much about electrification, as you say. And even, uh, even in the face of some weakness coming through in the Chinese market, they seem to be doing okay, managing to offset, with the, offset that with growth in Japan and in India. And with all of these earnings stories, as I said at the top of the program, we're sort of asking whether this earnings story is going to be enough this time around to yeah. offset the new reality around interest rates. And if that's putting downward pressure on stocks, can these earnings story, uh, stories help to reignite some upward pressure? Perhaps not in the stock market. It feels like at least it has to be the consensus because you're still seeing these companies. Yes, they're, they're catching up, but they're still not trading at the, the guy's favorite word, multiples and the valuations yeah. of the states. And that would create a kind of, in theory, a, a little bit of more room for them to maneuver. Take a look at the Bloomberg Intelligence analysis off ABB. They're starting to talk about a mega trend, especially when it comes yeah. to this bid. They're saying that this is not just a short-term, one-quarter, two-quarter thing. This is for the next decade. ABB has been one of those businesses that's been part of a mega trend since I've been sitting at so desks robotic. talking about but, this but, for the, like yeah. 20 years, hasn't it? It has been. It was part of the robotics trend. It, yeah. was, part of the, it, it was part of the kind of, as we went into the e-commerce world, it played a part yeah. in that as well. When emerging markets were booming yep. in the 2000s, it was all about their first wave of, uh, of, of investment in infrastructure yep. whilst the developed world were reinventing their infrastructure. Yep. So, were, yeah, plenty of solid lines there. Let's talk about cars, though, because, I mean, there's an electric Electrification story there or not? A good not. One. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so it seems as if withdrawal of subsidies in some countries continue to have an impact on a slightly reduced appetite for EVs. We've seen these car sales reduce this time. Uh, this is the second month in four where we're seeing this drop. A bit of an influence of Easter, uh, but it does really tell a, a powerful story about the, the role that subsidies play in this industry and any consumer-facing industry, I suppose, and, and the timing, therefore, of purchases. It does, and I, I think this is important that we kind of broaden this out, though, because even though kind of the last, I think, couple of months where we've broken this particular data, you do see, and I think you're seeing it on the screen here, some drops, some weakness, a little bit of a downtrend. But if you look at the net-net numbers, there is still a massive kind of growth picture here over a broader time frame. When you look at EVs, there is still that transition. When we talk to the commodity voices in on our show yeah. and in various parts of the world, they're still saying that that's the trend that they're positioning for. Again, speaking of megatrends. But, but has it reached... The, the subsidy story is really important. If you want these things to progress, we're talking about chip distribution around the world, the kind of where we manufacture. Yeah. Do you need to continue the subsidies? Have they pulled the subsidies back too early? Mm -hmm. you, you've kind of gone through the initial kind of beta testers, the, the high-end consumers that are willing to take the risk on an electric car. It hasn't yeah. become a mass consumer product yet no. in the way that they had hoped to do so and it's almost this phase that you need the subsidies to really kind of kick in the high-end consumers they were going to do it anyway they were probably going to do it anyway yeah. and now you need that kind of larger industrialization kind of process to kick in and maybe the only way you do that like everything else is with is with government money yeah okay lots to think about when it comes to autos and all of those other earnings stories that we've covered this morning let's just give you a quick briefing on what we're expecting to to come through today in terms of data and other sort of set pieces 130 uk time us industrial uh, sorry initial jobless claims of course we get existing home sales from the states a little bit later l'oreal numbers those will be out after hours throughout the day of course we'll be continuing to monitor what comes out of the g20 financial and central bank policy makers meeting in Washington, D.C. A lot of lines from the IMF uh, just last night around debt levels and being concerned around uh, U.S. and Chinese debt levels. We'll also have lots of central bank speak, of course, for you. Speaking at these events, we'll monitor the BOE's Megan Green, Mario Centino from the ECB, the Fed's Michelle Bowman. So a lot to think about. I just wanted to go back thinking about what's coming out of the G20 and all these meetings. It, it underscores an interesting 
uh, story that we're watching, and that is yen intervention. We had an interesting trilateral meeting taking place between the US, the Japanese, the South Koreans, and yeah. some are interpreting that meeting and the joint communique that came out of it as a US toleration for intervention by the BOJ finance ministry, yeah. even when we get there. And of course, we've got the BOJ meeting next week. We do, and, and I think this is important, and, and this was actually uh, flagged to me by, uh, by a viewer actually yesterday. If you look at the IMF growth forecasts, it's a no-brainer of, of why the dollar is doing so, so strongly right now and why people are positioning long for it despite some of the concerns that they'd initially had uh, mm. in, in previous iterations. You talk about currency intervention as well. This is certainly something that the Federal Reserve is watching very, very closely. I love that what Guy keeps saying, it's, it's our currency, your problem. That definitely seems to be the mentality mm. uh, there. But a strong dollar is an issue as well when it comes to things like exporting oil, exporting LNG. And if you look at some of the domestic policies within the states right now, they are actively trying to boost those exports while competing with the weakness you're seeing in the Japanese yen, in the Korean won, obviously the yuan as well. Yeah. How, how much tolerance there will be, we'll wait and see. Whether mm. or not there's an active involvement in the process, I think, is probably... Uh, maybe a step too far, but it, it does feel like the Japanese are just buying time until that BOJ meeting next week. Mm. Please, I, you've got a big meeting coming up. Let's not do anything before that. It feels like there's a kind of date in the diary for next week on that. There has been some uh, speak a little bit from not BOJ officials necessarily, but from the, some of the kind of uh, other fiscal authorities that yeah. are saying, well, maybe we maybe it's time to think about another hike as opposed to the kind of that one and done mentality that we have seen in the last 30 days. Um, that's going to be something we talk about. We're going to watch it again very, very closely, of course, in the coming weeks. But we're also going to be watching crypto very, very closely. We've had a really interesting interview and a couple of other charts, if I say so myself. Coming up, Binance CEO Richard Tang joins us from Dubai to get up the latest from the crypto giant. Plus, a little bit more going on in the banking space. UBS set for a fresh round of job cuts as it migrates, uh, integrates, excuse me, Credit Suisse. We'll get the details up next. So more Fed officials join Jay Powell in indicating a potential rate cut delay maybe on the table. We'll get back to the market story next. Of course, if you have any questions or uh, of any of your own for your guests, please send them to us on IB plus TV Go. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. In terms of where we see Europe going forward, it is recovering and we are clearly seeing signs of recovery now, beginning timid and picking up in the course of 24. And our forecast for 25-26 is 1.5, 1.6% growth. ECB President Christine Lagarde, of course, speaking in Washington at the spring meetings of the IMF and the World Bank. And let's get an investor perspective on European growth. Dirk Steffen joins us, CIO for EMEA and Global Chief Investment Strategist at Deutsche's private bank. Very nice to see you, Dirk. Thank you so much for joining us uh, bright and early this morning. Good morning. Uh, so let me start where Christine Lagarde left off. She's talking about growth expectations for Europe, a growth recovery in Europe being factored in. Are you investing into a European growth recovery? Uh, of course we do. I mean, being European, we have to be optimistic about our own economy, even though, admittedly, elsewhere we have much stronger growth. But uh, as we didn't really have a deep recession or anything um, similar to that, we also don't have a boom. So we really have to, you know, to, to take the magnifying glass to see that growth. But yes, I would agree that it's actually improving and we are investing on that by our various sectors in the European equity markets. Mm. I wonder how much time, Dirk, you spend thinking about Brussels. And I ask this in the context <laughs> of the European meetings, the European leaders meeting to talk once again about competitiveness and about uh, capital markets union and the like, and the way that Europe can stand up to competition from the US with the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, and everything that China throws at its industries. Uh, Dirk, does this move the dial for you at all? Anything Brussels can do, anything Europe can do on a policy perspective, is it, is it enough to change the narrative for Europe? I mean, um, I actually think that Europe does many things, but uh, the marketing effort uh, to really talk about that is, is much weaker than elsewhere. So if you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, the, these are very big numbers, of course, and um, so it's, it's rightly in the press, but if you look at the European initiatives, 
if you look at the budget and the next generation EU, for instance, you add everything up, you also um, are talking about two trillion euros so for, for um, a few years. And uh, now some recent developments are um, going largely unnoticed, like, for instance, uh, the payments that are now coming uh, for Poland, uh, where we talk about if everything goes according to plan over the next few years, about 18% of GDP. And uh, we have actually a lot of growth stimulus also in Europe. But I would agree that elsewhere um, it's much easier and quicker to get the money. And that's why companies are moving. But I think uh, over the long term, the European yep. appro approach is probably uh, the better one to do it. Okay. Wow. You, yeah. It doesn't feel like that right now, but maybe with with time, maybe you I can agree. be uh, spot on there. I agree. <laughs> yeah. So, so given given where the numbers are right now, let's talk about what we do with that. Am I selling U.S. bonds and buying European bonds? What is the compare and contrast in terms of the fixed income story on either side of the Atlantic? The problem with that is always the market itself, right? So there's uh, quite a bit of pricing action already that has happened. Uh, that's why we think we are probably close to, to something that's actually reflecting the, the most recent growth patterns, which are more tilted towards uh, the US. And at some point, I think uh, this, this will turn again. So um, we think most of the, the price action in the US Treasury market is probably behind us. So for us, these uh, levels we see in the US are um, actually above equilibrium. So over time, probably it's a good idea to average in and buy these uh, elevated um, yield levels. As for Europe, uh, this could go on for a while. But uh, if you look at some parts of the Chinese economies and even in Germany, if you look at industrial production, for instance, uh, then uh, you, you could make the case, just like Lagarde said, that over time, very gradually, we get better growth uh, in Europe. And that should be then um, also relevant for bond investors to take into account. Derek, it's Creedy in London. What goes wrong here? It feels like the commentary in the markets is that could the consumer is holding up fine. The ECB is going to handle what the European economy needs. What goes wrong? What breaks? I mean, the, I don't really get the question because I think it's going more or less according to plan. So as inflation is um, apparently uh, slightly less of a problem in Europe now compared to the US. So the, the ECB actually is in a position that they, they can cut rates, which would help um, certain sectors in the European economy. And other than that, uh, as I said initially, we only expect a very gradual improvement of growth because um, especially in the core, if you look at Germany, um, potential growth rates are only uh, barely half a percentage point. So we shouldn't expect too much here. And if we get a little help on um, the second half of the year from the ECB, that, that should also then smoothen out the, the problems here we have. Dirk, great to catch up. Nice to see you. Thanks for stopping by to see us. Dirk Stefan, CIO for EMEA, Global Chief Investment Strategist, joining us from Deutsche's private bank. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up, we need to talk about what's happening uh, in the world of crypto. Um, we're going to speak to the CEO of uh, one of the world's, or the world's largest crypto exchange, our conversation with Richard Tang from Binance. That is coming up next. Gold, crypto, I think that's an interesting trade right now. It does feel as if maybe crypto is a little bit more aligned to what we're seeing uh, in terms of what was going on in the Nasdaq right now. And you've also had this great run into ETFs. Do we start to see a little bit of profit taking? Maybe that's a narrative that we're going to see, see uh, developing over the next few weeks. So the halving, obviously, is tomorrow. And that's maybe why we're talking about this. Anyway, that is uh, all coming up. European markets preparing for the open. A little bit of corporate news to digest. This is Bloomberg. Thursday, the 18th of April, half an hour to go until we start trading here in Europe. Futures action for, for the bulk of the markets looks like we're going to be up around eight tenths of one percent. Eurostox 50 up by eight tenths of one percent. FTSE's going to bounce back. CAC looks like it's going to be a little bit of an underperformer today. I wonder if there's a bit of LVMH action in the mix there. We'll come back to that story in a moment. Um, in terms of corporate news, ABB looks strong this morning. We're obviously watching the chip read across mm. the TSMC. EasyJet out with numbers this morning as well. I'm just going to flag this too. Yeah. Really 
sort of kind of crystallizing the impact that the Middle East crisis is having on their numbers. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see kind of how, how this affects the earnings season, kind of how many other companies talk about what is happening yeah. in terms of the geopolitics impacting what they're doing right now. So a lot of sectors to watch. We'll watch aviation with that in mind. We're watching mining stocks. BHP's been on the move during the Australian session. We'll yep. watch uh, chip companies, as you say, post-TMC and post-ASML, crucially, because yeah. the setup yesterday was so negative, the way that the Nasdaq was then, you know, down by 1.2% or so in session. The expectation around tech is, is low, or the sentiment coming into today is low. Where does the leadership come from remains the question. Is this a tech-led -led session? And Guy and I were talking about this yesterday. Is this then ultimately a luxury story in, in terms of LVMH, yep. given the outperformance? Or the miners? I'm going to bring it back to you, Anna. Uh, the miners, the metals, the commodity complex as a whole, when you're looking at oil prices higher, but also in light of the news we got in the last 24 hours that President Biden mm. looking to uh, perhaps imply, uh, imply, impose, is the word I'm looking for, yeah. yep. uh, even more steel tariffs on China. There's a read-through there into the rest of the world. Yeah, and there's been some movement in Asian stocks as a result of that. Some yeah. of the steelmakers uh, outside of China benefiting as a result of this. The, the possibility that we go back to those conversations about more tariffs. I'm going to turn my attention to Bitcoin miners, mm. because they're about to have an interesting uh, few what hours. What a smooth transition. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, as we get into the halving, obviously, they get less in terms of the effort they put in uh, for that process. Now, in some ways, this has been front run. This is, we've seen a big move already uh, in terms of Bitcoin. So, so maybe you don't get the normal effect that you would get from the halving. Let's carry on the conversation and talk more about what is happening in the crypto space. Bloomberg's Vonnie Quinn is in Dubai. We need to talk more about this, Vonnie. Guy, thank you. Yes, Token49 here in Dubai, and we have a very special guest, the CEO of Binance, Richard Tang, who's, of course, just in the job, not even six months yet. A lot of history in the Monetary Authority of Singapore, also Abu Dhabi Global Market, and much, much more. So we're delighted to welcome you. Guy was just talking about halving. We'll get to that in a moment. First, any news to share on licenses? Thanks so much, Ronnie. I think I'm very excited to share here, breaking it on Bloomberg, that we have secured our full license with the Dubai Virtual Asset Regulatory Authority, and that allow us to serve the full suite of customers from institutions to high net worth individuals to retail customers uh, with a much fuller suite of products, right? so from sport to margin to earned products. And uh, we are looking forward to working very closely with both the regulators here as well as the partners here to bring about a very vibrant ecosystem in Dubai. Right? And you know, crypto is a 24-7 market. Uh, where traditional markets are closed, people can still take investment strategy, trading, hedging strategies that you see after markets and throughout the weekend. So we're very excited to serve the Dubai market and beyond. Well, congratulations. Now, I know you were very close to picking a location for a headquarters, which you had promised, and you had narrowed jurisdictions. Might Dubai be the new headquarters? Well, uh, we are still in discussion with several jurisdictions on that front. And you understand that global headquarters issue is uh, we have to go through quite a fair bit of deliberation. We have instituted our global board of directors, so I'm working very closely with them, going through the different jurisdictions. Um, Give us a short list. Uh, is, is Dubai on I, there? I, is Abu Dhabi? I would set out the parameters for consideration. I think that's more important for us. So it's very deliberate, as I mentioned. So we have to look at, you know, in terms of jurisdiction, whether they have the regulatory framework to cater to our suite of products and services, which is very wide. Today, we have close to 188 million customers globally. Uh, we are the largest exchange in the world. So it's able to cater to that, able to cater to us in terms of, you know, we are looking at things like double taxation agreement globally, uh, whether we can base our key management in those jurisdictions. So we are in deep conversation with several jurisdictions on that front. Roughly how many? I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't speculate okay. on that front, but as and when we have news, we will, we will break it. Yeah. You just named a board of directors, as you said. Now, the chairman is a career diplomat from Barbados, and you have also three of the early employees as you know, members of the board. How, what about this will give outsiders confidence that you're looking at things like compliance and at changing your culture? Well, I have set out very clearly at the start of my tenure as CEO that I make three commitments to the global ecosystem. First is continue to be user focused. Uh, users are very important to us. As you can see, in the first quarter of this year, we have added 60 million new users onto the platform. So we stand up close to 188 million uh, with assets being held by users close to 120 billion today. Right? 
So the, the business continues to grow in a very strong fashion. My second commitment is to working with global regulators to uphold global standards mm -hmm. on that front. And third is working with both global as well as local partners to support crypto adoption, which is still at a very early stage of development. So the promises are still intact. Yes. Bitcoin down about 14% in the last 10 sessions, roughly. Is this a halving event? Halving obviously imminent. Well, I mean, Bitcoin goes through cycle. I mean, the crypto industry goes through cycle. It's, it's to be expected. There's going to be market volatility. It doesn't only impact the asset front. I mean, given the geopolitical tension, given the interest rate environment that we are seeing, the inflationary environment, but, uh, the crypto industry is impacted like other asset classes. Right? So, but we are bullish long term because the institutions money are coming in, something that you have not seen before, 2020, 2024. So that is very bullish. We have clarity of rules in many jurisdictions now that allow us to deploy. So the longer term trend is, is one that's bullish. So that's true, but we have seen a lot of outflows out of some of the US ETFs in recent days. And I know you think the cycle is different in terms of where we'll see the peak. Have we seen the 2024 peak? Well, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't predict on that front. But this cycle is indeed unique, right? So normally you see an all-time high in terms of Bitcoin prices after the halving episode. But this time around, because of the liquidity of the user flow uh, from the US ETF, uh, we saw the all-time high in terms of Bitcoin prices happening before the halving, right? But as I mentioned, it's bullish because, I mean, other than the US, you have Hong Kong recently announcing approval of Bitcoin ETF as well as Ether ETF, right? And you see many other jurisdictions going to come onto the bandwagon. A lot of institutions, endowment, foundation are coming on stream and that's going to bring new user class into this. New, in terms of regulations, clarity of rules are going to give confidence to users into this asset class. So we are still at the beginning. Crypto adoption globally is only about 5% today. So we are very confident that the pace of adoption over the course of the next five years is going to be much faster than the last five. So you're going to bring a lot more investors into this asset class. Can I ask when the last time you spoke with CZ was? Well, uh, CZ is in the States now. I think, I think everybody knows that. Uh, he's a uh, controlling shareholder of Binance, uh, as he has shareholders rights on that front. Right? Uh, we just have to observe the corporate governance framework that we have put in place in Binance, which is the board of directors they are the corporate stewards of the company driving this enterprise going forward. What are the plans for him to divest or to take more steps away from any parts of the company? I, I can't speak on his behalf. I think those questions you should direct towards him as, as a shareholder on that front. So he does still have a lot of control over decisions? Well, he, con he continues to be a controlling shareholder of the company. What are you doing in terms of discussions with the Nigerian officials and the Nigerian government about the employee who's detained, Tigran Gambarian, and the person who's obviously fled and now in Kenya? I think there's, I know the interest on that front. Uh, we appreciate the interest, but this is a sensitive matter. So we are in conversation with the Nigerian government. Our key priority is to get Tigran home safely, right? So Tigran is a person of the highest integrity, highest professional. I think people that knows him knows that he has worked his he has devoted his entire lifetime previously with U.S. agencies and now as our head of financial crime, working with global law enforcement agencies to fight illicit crime and fight financial crimes. Uh, we are giving him and his family all the support needed and our key priority, our prayers, is to bring Tigran home safely as soon as possible. Richard, congratulations on the new license to operate in Dubai and thank you for your time. Richard Tang, CEO of Binance. Kriti, I'll send it back to you. Bloomer's Ronnie Quinn there speaking to the CEO of Binance uh, Global Holdings. We thank you so much for bringing us that interview. Look, I'm going to stick with the crypto space here and bring it right back to the macro because we're talking a lot about where does Bitcoin fall in the portfolio broadly, especially at a time when we're seeing outperformance in the stock market, in gold especially. And that's really where uh, I have a chart that caught my eye. I want to bring it to your attention, Guy, Anna, this idea here that if crypto is the new digital gold, uh, how is it faring with regular gold? Is it actually kind of doing its job? So I've got a two panel chart here. It gets a little wonky. Stick with me. In that first panel, you've got gold and Bitcoin, two lines, very straightforward. They're on a logarithmic scale. They look pretty identical that they're moving on par. But if you break down the correlation, which is that second panel there on the bottom, it's a 40 day correlation. They're actually moving uh, fairly positively now, but that hasn't been the trend all year long. So if you're talking about gold right now at these record highs, does that incentivize a Bitcoin bid as well. Of course, uh, correlation is not going to be causation, but right now they are moving in tandem. And I'm curious if that means 
Bitcoin is an inflation hedge or is being used as an inflation hedge or is it being used as a risk appetite mm. kind of dynamic in relative to the stock market? I don't know how to think about Bitcoin, but I thought it was interesting that it's moving in yeah. line with gold. Are they both? Well, and both of them can move with the Fed, can't yeah. they? So are they both just functions of the Fed? Same bias? Feels like it probably isn't the same sort of buyer mm, cohort that is probably buying these two different products and maybe therefore people are buying for different reasons and buying the products to satisfy very different demands. It feels like central banks are buying pretty aggressively in the gold space. ETF buying has not been there, whereas ETF buying has been there in the crypto space yeah. and has come through. And I wonder whether or not that's where the... It's interesting, we've seen these big inflows into some of these ETFs. Are we about to see some outflows, some profit-taking? It's been a really good run for crypto since those ETFs were launched. So I think it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on that chart. Maybe that divergence that was there at the end, those jewels maybe start to widen a little bit. And we should mention that the correlation, I think, is only a two-tenths of one percent correlation. So yeah. my, the Mark Cudmore in my head, the kind of devil on my you shoulder. Mark Cudmore in your head. I do, I do. Wow, that's hey, something you don't want to have. I know. He used to be my boss, so I can't help it. Uh, but he would always say 0.2% or 20% of correlation is not enough for yeah. a trend to sit. So we have to wait for it to build a little bit. But yes, he is in my head. There we go. Way. We all need challenge from wherever it comes. <laughs> and we've got uh, chips in focus this morning. And just on that subject, I'll just mention this red headline across the Bloomberg terminal. TSMC sticking with its expectations around CapEx. Full year CapEx of 28 yeah. to $32 billion. I think this is interesting, Kriti, in the context of what you were saying earlier about how, you know, may, is it ASML that's at the forefront of the chip story or is it TSMC? Because we're getting a better story out of TSMC this morning. Yeah, is it the tail wagging the dog or the dog wagging its tail? Right, isn't that the, the proper, yeah. pro proper phrase? Uh, well, coming up on the program, we're going to talk about just that. TSMC posting its first profit rise in over a year. We'll discuss the semiconductor industry as companies ramp up that AI spend. That conversation next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Markets Today. We are 15 minutes away from the start of cash equities trading here in Europe. And the futures picture points a little higher this morning. U.S. futures also pointing higher. That has not been the direction of travel over recent days, though. Let's talk uh, about the markets in a few minutes with Markets Live executive editor Mark Cudmore, who joins us now. Mark, uh, good morning. Let's start with the latest uh, rethinking around the Fed, because uh, we've seen markets respond to this in the last few days, haven't we? A sort of rethink of the Fed's pivot in December. Did the markets get too carried away? I suppose one question that stands out to me is whether the Fed wants to see tightening of financial conditions, whether they'll be happy to see stocks retreat a little bit, uh, because then that means the Fed doesn't have to step up and tighten those conditions themselves. I think they will be happy with a little bit of tightening of financial conditions. I think, unfortunately, though, the Fed has lost control of the narrative. They were just so premature. They, re in December, repeating the mistake of 2021 by being just way too easy in monetary policy terms relative to the strength of the economy means they're losing credibility. They've lost control of the narrative. And what we saw this week was a concession by Powell even that they have lost control of the narrative. So really, you know, what we've seen in the last uh, kind of couple of months is that the market got way ahead of the Fed as well. The market has kind of admitted that the data was too strong. Now the Fed's admitting the data is too strong. Both, both the Fed and the markets are being bullied by the data here. And the data is saying there is no chance of a rate cut anytime soon unless things change drastically. And there is no hint on the, the horizon that there is any kind of crisis brewing. Obviously, things can change, but they're not going to change in next week. We need a whole string of data mm. to change the narrative. So for now, the direction of travel for the yields is still higher. Yeah, it seems precisely three inflation prints to change the narrative. That's perhaps what we've learned as well over the last few over the last few weeks. So with that in, in mind then, Mark, the dollar has been continuing to rise. Dollar strength, the big talking point, yen weakness, weakness in other currencies as well, of course. But that, that has put the yen in focus over a period. And we've watched overnight as we see uh, stories around maybe the U.S. tolerating yen intervention. How does that set us up for next week when we get to the next BOJ? Look, I think the BOJ is going gonna, is gonna to get increasingly air on the hawkish side. I think what's the interesting narrative this year is that we're going to have in 2024 the BOJ move rates by more than the Fed. That seemed kind of fantastical at the start of the year when you're pricing in more than six rate cuts from the Fed. And the idea that the BOJ was an active central bank was still kind of uh, a pipe dream. But it looks like the, the BOJ is probably going to hike rates a couple more times this year. And obviously this yen weakness is going to kind of force them even more likely into kind of action. So I think the risk going to next week's BOJ 
is it's slightly live and the risk is it's hawkish turn. OK, thanks so much, Mark. Bloomberg Markets Live, Executive Editor Mark Cudmore, uh, with the latest thinking on the markets. And remember, you can uh, get up-to-date analysis and insight from Mark and the rest of the Markets Live team. MLIV Go is the function to use to find the Markets Live blog on the Bloomberg Terminal. That's the function you want to use if you want Mark Cudmore in your head, basically. <laughs> MLIV Go, Mark's in your head. Um, let's talk about what's happening in the chip space. So we've seen some weakness over the last few days. Names like NVIDIA have been down, certainly off their highs. Um, and potentially actually in a correction territory, 10% off the highs. So does TSMC start to change that narrative today? It says this morning, in terms of the delivery it's given us, uh, in terms of the data, that it expects revenue to rise as much as 30% this quarter. It expects full year CapEx and think ASML here, 28 to $32 billion. Now, ASML was talking about a pickup in the second half of the year. Is that what we're ultimately looking at there? Robert Lee, senior analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence, here to talk us through what we need to know. Robert, we have seen some chip weakness. The SOX has been down, NVIDIA's been down, ASML's been down. Does TSMC turn the tide? Is that what we should read into these Q1 numbers? Um, I think that might be overstating a little bit because obviously the market always looks ahead. Um, Taiwanese companies announced their monthly sales, so we knew where Q1 revenue was and it was uh, slightly above the mid-range of their guidance. So I think the market was expecting decent Q numbers, which is what we've seen. So Q1 uh, profit was 3 or 4% ahead of expectations. But as you know, it's all about the guidance and the outlook. Well, that's the TSMC-specific story. How much in terms of kind of that forward guidance do we pay attention to? Uh, not just the ASML story, but what's going on with Apple, what's going on with Android as well. What are the leading indicators for TSMC? Okay, you mentioned ASML, so looking out to a much uh, longer time frame, ASML's got an order book to die for, really. Um, so the EUV orders they talk, or intake they talked about uh, yesterday relate more to deliveries that would come through the tail end of this year and into 2025. So I think there is a question mark as to the demand outlook um, you know, on that longer or medium term time scale, but that has no relevance to TSMC in this current quarter, Q2, or for the year as a whole. So coming back to a nearer term time frame, um, the call is ongoing as, as we speak. Uh, Q2 guidance is again about just under 5% ahead of expectations, so that's great. Unsurprisingly driven by uh, AI. Um, their gross margin guidance because of some short-term disruption from the earthquake and also hiking electricity costs in Taiwan, that is a little bit lower, but I think the market should take that in its stride. But there, I think there are two other question marks there for TSMC, uh, which you just referred to. One of them is Apple. On our estimates, Apple's 20 to 25 percent of their revenue. I think the story on the China iPhone weakness is well known. So given Apple is still a very large uh, customer for them, that's one question mark there. And the other is automotives. Doesn't really get the headlines, but automotives is around 13, 14 percent of their revenue. We are again seeing incremental weakness on the EV side. So I think uh, there's a question mark there. The summary is, or the mm. question is, if I leave you with that, is to what extent is this ongoing, you know, rampant demand in AI uh, likely to offset potential incremental weakness in other parts of their business? That seems to have been the case for Q1, which is reported. That seems to be the case for Q2. But will it still remain the case into the end of the year? So I think that's the key question people need to focus on. OK, thanks very much, Robert. Good to speak to you. Robert Lee from Bloomberg Intelligence with the latest on the chip space. Really interesting, that uh, link to the auto story, which we were talking about here uh, from a European uh, car registrations perspective at the top of the last hour. Let's get a rundown of the stocks we're watching this morning. Joe Easton from our equities team has a briefing. Joe. Morning, Anna. So we've got earnings out of Nokia today. The Finnish company beating expectations on their net profit for the quarter. But it is a bit more mixed than the initial headline suggests because net sales are actually weaker than analysts expected, even as the company says that the network infrastructure orders are improving. But that sales miss potentially feeding into concerns around some contracts going to the big rival Ericsson and also mobile phone firms cutting back. So it's a bit of a difficult one to read. Here we've got the two big rivals on the screen here. Nokia has been 
the underperformer. But I have seen a note from City today saying that potentially it has been another slow start. City is one of the very few analysts with a sell rating on Nokia. Keep an eye. We'll see where that one opens over in Helsinki today. Then we're also looking at Danone. This is, of course, the big French consumer goods company, maker of yogurt and also water products. We've got sales out of them. And they were getting an initial positive read on some of those headlines. A lot of that driven by the water business. Here's some of the numbers on the screen. The like-for-like -like sales across the group up 4%, estimated 3.5%. Water sales up 8%, but they do warn of some impacted issues with the shipping. That has kind of eased recently, they said, calling it temporary. Then we're going to look at Royal Mail. The owner, IDS, is the subject of a takeover bid. News of this did come during the main market trading yesterday. However, right at the cusp of trading, closed, we did get a statement from IDS giving us the share price that was offered, and it was 320 pence a share. They said they rejected it. Now, the bid is coming over from the Czech Republic, the billionaire Daniel Krasinski. He has a big stake in the firm already. He wants to buy the whole company. He owns around 28% at the moment. The bid price would bring it up to about here. Peel Hunt analysts reckon it's worth about 360, but if we take it back to the pandemic, that's still massively below where it traded at the peak as people bought more goods online. So potentially that is why they see the business as undervalued. Royal Mail, IDS in the headlines. Keep an eye on that one at the Open in London. Thanks, Joe. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think the, the Brits are going to have something to say about this. Be interesting to see kind of how the, uh, how the papers deal with this one over the next few days. The Royal Mail being taken over. Uh, anyway, let's talk a, a little bit about where we are in terms of the market open this morning. I think we're looking at a fairly positive picture. Are we going to see a, a early bid fading? I think just kind of look at that price action in terms of the way it works throughout the day. It's important right now. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Marks Today. We're just a few minutes away from the start of cash equity trading. You are seeing futures in the green here. A little bit of outperformance right here in the UK. The FTSE 100 higher by about five tenths of one percent, but the Euro stocks 50 right on its heels as well. Corporate stories. It's the micro that's in focus today. Yeah, it is the micro, and also mindful of where we closed yesterday with technology stocks down by 2.8 percent. Such was the downdraft here and also in the US yep. to some degree. And those numbers out of ASML that that you know that's how we close things out. Feeling pretty gloomy about the chip sector, and then you add on top of that the TS. SMC story today, which has a, a brighter mood to it. You wonder where that heads. Is it enough to change the narrative? Because SML certainly felt like it changed the narrative, but it was a narrative that was already beginning to shift. I, NVIDIA's been down hard, semiconductors down hard, ASML is down hard. Yeah. I keep coming back to this question. Does, does, is, does what we're getting from TSMC this morning change that narrative in a meaningful way to maybe put a floor under it? Because if NVIDIA keeps falling then the, the wider market story is going to become a little uglier. Mm. And I think there's some very real reasons. Infineon, I think, is the one that I really have my eye on in the European session. Does it take the lead from ASML? Does it take the lead from TSMC? And that's not one I quite have well, my eye on. does it take this cue from the auto sector? I was just hearing oh, yeah. about that. So you've seen this, this week auto sales numbers this morning. Is that so? Because Infineon highly exposed yeah. to that story as well. ABB is going to be interesting this morning. Uh, I think EasyJet is interesting, Jet, yeah. interesting this morning as well. Um, the fact that we're seeing a clear, crystallized impact from the Middle East coming through in those numbers. Yeah, a reminder from our colleague at Bloomberg Intelligence that 13% of TSMC's revenues come from the auto sector, to your point, Guy. So, yeah, yeah, putting together the weakness that we're seeing in EV demand with some of the chip sector, that may be also one that we need to watch. So let's uh, talk, us, uh, talk, talk you through these markets. Um, so a positive start is what is expected. So the FTSE 100 uh, is expected to start up by kind of five, six, seven, eight tenths of 1%. The single stories are going to matter here. The CAC looks like it's going to be potentially an area of weakness. So we're going to watch out and maybe see what happens with some of the, uh, the luxury names this morning. There's already some downgrades coming through post yeah. those LVMH numbers. And right out of the gates, you have EQT, of course, uh, coming out of Stockholm, one of your biggest weights on the stock 600. Uh, this coming off after a wave of downgrades, despite the fact, and this was downgrades yesterday after the yep. bell, despite the fact that they actually have an AUM and outperformance 
in uh, a lot of their funds as well. Interesting, though, with the market not viewing that as a positive this morning. Mm, I'm keeping an eye on the mining sector, looking for an open on some of these uh, mining companies this morning. BHP out with uh, production numbers, lifted the stock during the Asia session. We also have, during the Asia session, uh, strength coming through in some of the uh, basic uh, metals, the, the, the metals themselves. Iron ore prices, for example, were stronger. And this was about iron ore production. So we'll see whether we get some movement higher. Basic resources as a sector do seem to be higher this morning. SML's bouncing back quite nicely. So maybe, we, maybe we're starting to get an answer. Maybe the TSMC um, CapEx story is in a, it got battered yesterday. So there's, there's kind of, do you buy the dip in, mm. t, in ASML? But it's interesting, Schneider's also gaining as well. Um, I've yet to see a price on ABB. We'll see when that comes through. I've yet to see an opening price coming through uh, on ABB. Came through in yesterday's session into the numbers quite strongly. So we'll see what the market reaction there is. Uh, but uh, Schneider is up. Some of the drug stocks are coming through as well quite nicely. But the, but the oil stocks, after yesterday's big move, in terms of those inventory numbers in the States, yeah. they're down pretty hard. So Shell, BP, Total, all weighing on the market. Yeah, we saw a drop of 3% in oil prices in yesterday's session. And, of course, yeah. they rallied on the back of geopolitical tensions. But, you know, maybe that was even limited to some degree in the very near term because we, we sort of factored a lot of that in. Uh, but, yeah, they did fall yesterday. Weaker Chinese industrial data, part of the story. Also, as you mentioned, Guy, the, uh, the U.S. crude inventories. Uh, we talk about these airlines. I'm surprised that you haven't mentioned this yet. I'm, Easy I'm Jet is higher. <laughs> give, give, give guys a, a second. Easy Jet higher by uh, about four and a half percent. IAG higher as well. Uh, the Easy Jet story is really interesting to me because they talk about this weight in the Middle East, but they're still saying that volumes are higher, bookings are trending higher. Yep. It's all positive outside of that one region. We heard that similar kind of commentary coming out of Ryanair, out of United, even um, yep. that this regional effect. Yes, it's a uh, temporarily a weight, but. The look, good. look this is, we're yeah. back to the Taylor Swift economy. Uh, I feel like I haven't spoken about that for a while. It's the Enrique Iglesias economy, please. Okay, we can call it that if you, if you really... <laughs> what really, year is this? If you really have to do that. <laughs> Sorry, Kirti. <yeah. Chrissy. laughs> that was you know, massive checks. shaming. I am checks, so happy with that. Check's diary, 2024. <laughs> Explain yourself. You know things are bad when Anna Edwards tells you. <laughs> and, and I have no right to connect, correct anybody's music taste, so I just, uh, just put that out there. Okay. Um, yes, uh, I'm going to go to the corner and just <laughs> shame myself. It's fine. <laughs> But, but people are spending money. People still want to travel, and that's the expectation for the summer, that people are yeah. still wanting to spend money. And this comes back to the... I think it was you, Anna, asked this question a little bit earlier on. Do you need to... And this is maybe related to the States, but does the Fed need to crack the stock markets hmm. in order to take away some of the, this source of funding that it generated out, out of that December pivot that people are continuing to spend? And it goes back to the crypto story. It goes back to everything else. So in order to maybe loosen... Sorry, to tighten financial conditions, do you need to crack the... The stock market to yes. generate that. And kind would of the a Fed story. be happy to see a little bit of that? They've would already Taylor created Swift be a bit. Happy to see oh that? I don't know. <laughs> Does she have views? Can we'll we just point in. out? I'm, I'm, I'm making a hard pivot because I'm, I'm still really. I'm sorry, I made the joke, <laughs> no, no, but he okay. laughed way too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I just, I, it's fine, it's fine. I, I, it was due. Comedy um, timing is everything, <laughs> and Anna nailed it. Can we go back to? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pivot. Uh, Jean Claude Trichet made this point on the stock market, particularly, didn't he? He yep. said that he was concerned about what was going on on both sides of the Atlantic, and I, and I, and that's, I think, the first time I've heard really, even a former kind of Fed or ECB monetary policy official talk about it in that way. The last person was Greenspan, I think. <laughs> well, when he was in role, yeah. Um, this is a weird market we're looking at today. So although you look at the overall moves and it looks kind of positive, doesn't it? We're up a quarter of a percent, not much. But there is a sort of positivity here. U.S. futures pointing higher as if we're trying to put the losses of yesterday and the tech weakness behind us. But then if you look at the sector breakdown, utilities is the best performing sector. Doesn't uh, fill you with any kind of risk on confidence, does it? No, but yields are down. Mm. That maybe kind of takes us in that direction as well. Yeah. Um, which I think is which I think is an interesting kind of part of that story. Very yield sensitive, as are obviously the real estate sectors. We are seeing yields coming down. So we've seen this really, and it's been the rate of change that I think in the bond market that has caught everybody on the hop. It's been this very very swift swift uh, acceleration to the upside. What do you now do with those bonds? Do you take profits on them? Um, and I think maybe there's some some evidence of that. Or are we in a position where actually you want to start locking in these yields? Well, we asked uh, Christian Moeller Glissman over at Goldman that very question. Take a listen to what he had to say. 
we've been through a few geopolitical tensions. The market has maybe become a bit desensitized. If you have a serious escalation, the bond market would react. And with regards to the auctions you were mentioning, I think that's a concern we've had since the summer of last year, that there is a lot of issuance coming and uh, investors need to be incentivized to buy uh, these bonds. Um, the incentive can come via a, a flight for safety bid or it can come via the yield. yield. The Goldman Sachs head of asset allocation research, Christian muller glussman speaking there in terms of what the bull case is for a bond market that doesn't seem to be attracting a lot of buyers. Let's get a little bit more perspective here. Tatiana uh, Grail Castro, uh, Castro, excuse me, of Musinesh, the public markets co-head, joins us this morning. I said, thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming in. Where do you stand on the bond story? Is a 4.6 percent yield attractive to you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, good morning. I mean, it is, there are so many conflicting uh, um, sort of viewpoints at the moment and, and also tensions, right? So this flight to safety clearly would be one argument where we would go and say, well, actually, we need to put position for that because, you know, there is uh, a big tail risk that something uh, 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 nasty could uh, um, materialize. Having said that, um, we also see that um, I think it's now a four times increase in the number of treasuries outstanding. So I think that is something that shouldn't yeah. be underestimated, that you need a large buyer base. It is a large buyer market. The other thing is, what is your positioning for? So is it a very short-term positioning? Um, and yes, there are CTAs that trade very, very short-dated. But then other um, asset owners, uh, that they would be longer-dated. Is this now the time to come in to be a long-term holder? And long-term meaning, you know, three months or, or even longer than that. And so those are those conflicting uh, um, zones. Where we stand here is 4.6, you know, it's clearly better than 4.2. Um, but at the same time, is it, you know, is it, is it screaming value? Probably not. You want to have some positioning because you want to hedge your bets with regards to the tail risk. But at the same time, is it going to be a screaming buy? And there, I think you should always make some calculations. So, for instance, 4.6 percent, let's say it goes to 5 percent. That's 40 basis points on the 10 year with, a, let's say, seven year duration. 40 basis points times seven is 4.8 percent. That's a negative return, right? Uh, sorry, 2.8 percent. That would yeah. be a negative return. So you start with 4.6, you subtract 2.8. All of a sudden, well, my full return for the year is, you know, is about 40% less than what's on the tin. 4. You don't make 4.6%, yeah. right? So the downside, I think, is still there at 4.6. But you should make a positive return for this year. But you wouldn't make a significant positive return. Well, that's on the assumption that yields will ultimately go. That would 5%. be higher, exactly. Uh, so, is what is the case? other? Yeah. What is the other? What is the other? So, there, there, I think you know we should be less focused on where interest rates will go for 2024, but what is your terminal rate, and when do we get to the terminal rate? So, if you get to the terminal rate only in 26, perhaps, or the end of 25, clearly that has an influence of the rest of the curve. So what is the timing of the terminal rate? And then is where do we go with the terminal rate? And, you know, if we go with the terminal rate just below 4%, let's say, three and a half, three and three quarters, yeah. and you think that generally it's about 70 basis points higher from that if you, if you sort of do the three months to the 10 year, yeah. then all of a sudden, yes, you know, you have... You come from 4.6 to 4.2. Same calculations, right? It's, it's the same 40 basis points. So you add 4.8. Yep. Um, so, and that gets you below a double-digit return. Do you really want to take that risk to, you know, then, then the thing is, is, are you getting paid enough yeah. for that upside? And I think that's, that's I think, the, the way we like to look at it. Okay, and so if you're thinking about when, you know, when the timing of when you get to that terminal rate, you're thinking about how sticky inflation is, Tatiana, and you raise an interesting point, which I think is, is, is worth mentioning, about the repeated increases in minimum wage that we've seen in various economies. And that takes us back to something we've been talking about over recent months, about real wages and how real wages are more of a story of 2024, even if we... Even even when we're, well, maybe because we're past peak inflation, as if the, the, the wage story is catching up with the inflation that we've, that we've seen previously. How does that play out then? It continues to keep inflation higher for longer. I think uh, generally it is sort of um, underestimated how many people are at min minimum wage or close to minimum wage and how many people get affected by, you know, that very sharp increase in the UK, in Europe, in the US of minimum wage. And then clearly how many uh, companies, especially smaller companies, rely on workers with minimum wage.
right? So, um, so then uh, uh, those companies will be forced to uh, uh, put a price increase through. And, and there is still this uh, ability also. I think there is little pushback yet mm. to, uh, to go and say, no, 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 you know, I'm not going to yeah. um, uh, accept higher prices. So there is still, I think, this inflation expectation and the acceptance that things have become more expensive and, yeah. uh, and therefore the products need to be more expensive. I think that is still playing out. And this is a group of people with high propensity to consume, perhaps. So does this bode well for consumption, for consumers? Exactly. Exactly. So that would be the demand, uh, you know, sort of would also be stimulated by that. So it uh, doesn't so sound we, like a rate cutting economy. But I mean, I know we're not talking about a particular geography here. It's more of a global yeah, yeah, trend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it is a global trend. Uh, and um, um, so, 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 yes, I think, you know, still being cautious uh, around duration. And the other thing is oftentimes, you know, we had a sense that uh, investors were blindly going into duration. That they, they didn't really do the calculations, which is very loosely, you know, sort of uh, pointed to uh, just earlier, uh, where it just seemed, it almost seemed like, you know, there was duration and it was like a, I almost seemed like, you know, the lemmings that blindly go and following duration without <laughs> really, without really calculating what is the return potential. What is the return at, you know, when it was inverted, yeah. when you have an upward sloping curve, when you have a low carry, you don't get the total return because of the slope of the curve. Is, is uh, it felt better? to me a little is bit. Is credit better? Is cash better? I, I, I'm why, why am I coming out of cash right now if, if I'm listening yes. to what you're saying right now? It doesn't seem to be a particular So, so uh, cash, there's two arguments for cash. I mean, cash clearly is an argument. Oftentimes it, it has tax advantages and, you know, and, and as you, yep. you know, we were saying the, the carry is the, the best really at the, at the cash curve. So um, um, the only argument would be that you have a, a, um, re a reinvestment risk. Yep. But that reinvestment risk would only be if you think that rates are going to rally and you need to come into rates before that rally happens. Yep. If there is a continued sell-off... Hey, rates there's are going a lower. Exactly. Yeah, markets are going higher. Exactly. Yep. If there is a continued sell-off, is there continued steepening, yep. then actually you take it the steepening means the short end performs well and you still have time to add duration. Credit? Uh, credit. Um, so there's two things. One is... Um, when everybody to talks about credit spreads being tight, we always point out, well, you know, you never go and say the Treasury has a yield of whatever it is. You always point to the different points in the curve. But when we talk about credit spreads, we just take credit spreads. We don't point to the different uh, points so in the curve. About, talk me through the points then. Where is so the uh, best value is actually in the belly in the short end. The worst value is in the long end. This yep. is where everybody was buying duration uh, and, yep. and it has dipped uh, significantly lower to the long-term average. Uh, the long-term average in Europe is still cheap in the belly and in the short end of the curve versus the 10-year average. In the US, it's slightly, you know, inside the long-term average. We clearly never are at the, at the average. Yep. So, um, so, yeah, we still see value in the, in the short and particularly European investment grade is still value. So look at different points in the curve when you talk about credit spreads, not just one point. In terms of credit, though, is there appetite? Or are you seeing growing appetite for some of the riskier parts of the market? Or is it still a stick with quality, et cetera? I'm specifically referring to the kind of the high yield market, triple C's, et cetera. You're seeing risk appetite in the stock market. You're seeing risk appetite even in parts of the EM space. Does that translate to high yield? Uh, yes, to the extent that if people go into high yield, um, you know, they would be buying a high yield strategy within that. So our portfolio managers are definitely still quality focused. Um, um, default rates haven't gone up as much as they could have if uh, they had gone through restructurings. But um, now we see actually even in the bond market that there is not full, full scale restructurings, so they're not necessarily classified as a default, but nonetheless you have to take a haircut as an investor. And so that is a new phenomenon, you know, we mm. talk about the uh, creditor and creditor violence, where, you know, there is uh, some creditors that form a group and they've already agreed a restructuring uh, with the company and then they come out and they push other creditors down the value chain. So there's lots of those things, little games kind of going on at the Don't moment. Pay attention to the details. Tatiana? Yes. Nice to see you. Thank you very much indeed Good for talking about CS. Tatiana Guillo Castro, co head of public markets and portfolio manager at Mizenich and Co. Thank you. Um, live bond maths on air.
Always loved it. <laughs> uh, let's talk about what's happening with the, uh, with the Core 6 this morning. This is what we're seeing, uh, a reaction, obviously, in some ways, to the TSMC numbers with ASML. It's up by around 6 tenths of 1%, but not an enormous bounce back from yesterday. Look at what's happening with Schneider. You've got ABB out with numbers this morning. Nestle kind of so-so. But the continuing declines, it's been a few days now. Nova Nordisk has been soft. LVMH comes back to being soft as well. Yesterday we saw a little bit of a pop, but things turning around. So that's the picture with the kind of the core of this market. What else are we watching? Joe's going to start on my favourite subject, airlines, Joe. So we will start on airlines, Guy, because they are getting a decent boost this morning. Following that report from EasyJet, the company is saying that summer bookings are strong. The excess capacity has come down slightly, and they've redeployed some of the capacity that was supposed to be used for the Middle East, given the geopolitical situation there. But the other thing, of course, is the decline in the oil price that we've seen since yesterday's close, and therefore potentially reducing short-term fuel concerns for these companies. So Ryanair, IAG, Wiz, all of those stocks getting a decent move, all green this morning in terms of the airlines. Then we'll look at a couple of other earnings stories. We had a few of them in Stocks to Watch. Nokia, as we mentioned, City was describing this as a weak start to the year in the telecoms business. 5G mobile network firms still not putting in as many orders as some had hoped. And a big decliner, this one, is Stedham Sartoria. Stedham down 16%. Now, this is a maker of lab equipment. They supply a lot to China, and that's where the weakness is coming from. It's medical lab equipment, agricultural equipment as well. And we're seeing that stock down 16% today as their sales disappoint analysts. Now, Deliveroo, a strong report from them. More than 70 million delivery orders placed in the last quarter. That's a lot of fast food, and that stock is gaining 6% at the moment. It has had a bad run, as we've discussed on the show before, but it's gaining today, recovering slightly. The best performer, though, on the stock 600 is Ikestron. This is an ASML rival. It's a maker of chip machinery. They've got a big order from a U.S. company called Wolfspeed. Breaking news on the terminal just come out. And that stock up around 7%. It's listed over in Germany. As I say, the best stock on the stock 600 this morning. Then we will take a look at a couple of M&A stories. Firstly, International Distribution Services, the owner of Royal Mail, coming down after that 28% gain yesterday. They have got a rejected takeover bid at 320 pence a share. It's only trading at 270. You might expect it might come a bit higher if people think that deal will go through. Then we're going to continue with the 2000s music uh, subject that you were discussing there because Hypnosis Songs Fund, <laughs> one that we don't tend to look at too much. This is a company that owns the royalties to Shakira, Red Hot Chili Peppers, all these groups and they've got a takeover bid from a US firm. It's valuing a them at more than a billion dollars. It is a big mover on the London market today. It's up 31% for a hypnosis. My favourite ticker as well, Song LN on the ticker for that one. Then a couple of morning calls to bring you. ASML, now you were talking about it earlier in your Super 6 guy, and we have got the first negative rating on that stock as Santander goes underweight. It's the only sell on the stock following that 6% decline that we saw in the shares yesterday, but it's coming up very slightly today, up 0.4%. As I say, Santander underweight on ASML. Then Halion, finally, is the Panadol and Paracetamol maker here in London, spun out of GSK a couple of years ago. HSBC reckons you should be buying that one. We're up 1%. It's a 370 pence price target, trading at 323. Halion slightly higher in London. OK, thanks very much, Joe. Joe Eaton from our equity team with all the 90s music references that you need. Uh, it, 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 it just, they just keep coming this morning, Chrissy. I, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> I'm, I'm in my element. So, uh, th these are music references I can, refer I can understand and recognise, so I'm happy. My, I, to be fair, my kids sing a lot of 80s songs, A, because I probably <laughs> play, play them in the car, 80s and 90s. All the movies have great soundtracks these days, uh, and they're all from the 80s and the 90s. And now we see private equity going after the, after the, uh, the money behind those, uh, those catalogs. Uh, really interesting hard pivot back to corporate credit. Not sure how I'd do that one, but um, really interesting. You, you need some sort of musical interlude. We do. To get we do. Uh, really interesting the way we were he hearing from Tatiana Guerrero Castro talking about corporate credit spreads there yeah. and tying in with the conversation we had earlier about maybe whether the Fed is going to be a little happy to see some pullback in, in, yep. uh, in financial conditions right now. I actually took that line from something Brown Brothers Harriman was saying. Uh, the Fed wants the market to do the tightening for them. Financial conditions remain too loose. Some combination of 
wider spreads, taking us back to Tatiana, yeah. higher yield, stronger dollar, lower equities is needed to tighten conditions. Maybe that's yeah. what we watch for as we wait for the next messaging from the Fed. The markets are in a really tricky and almost overly powerful, some would say, position here. Because on the one hand, you look at these kind of uh, credit markets, valuations are looking pretty good. It, on the surface, it looks like these are some really healthy companies. But then Tatia was just making that point. If you look below the surface, there are pieces. There is uh, strains being put even on investment-grade companies. You haven't seen that default cycle that's mm. so traditional. But then, to your point about kind of the markets and, and where, where you position, yep. there's still so much cash on the front end of the curve. And the markets are in charge a little bit, to some extent, of the interest rate story, more so than the Fed. Mark was talking about this earlier. The Fed's lost control of the narrative. And there's a nice piece on the, on the Bloomberg as well this morning talking about the fact that basically the Powell pivot is responsible for kind of where we are, this reacceleration. He came out in December. Mm. He's like, we're good to go, folks. We're going to be cutting. Surprisingly. But, yeah, you know, a, a I remember a lot of people remembering December. That yeah. was a big surprise. And, and as a result of which financial yeah. conditions eased dramatically. How do they tighten them? Maybe the markets have got the power to do that. OK, the banking sector clearly watching this just like many others. They're coming up, more cost-cutting at UBS. We'll get the latest on the Swiss bank as it continues to trim headcount at the Global Investment Bank post the absorption of Credit Suisse. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Let's talk about the banking sector. UBS apparently planning the next round of job cuts, part of the integration with Credit Suisse. Uh, the bank has uh, said, remember, that it's aiming to save around $6 billion in staff costs over the, the coming year. So this is part of the ongoing process. Tom Metcalf joins us now. Tom, what does this tell us about where we are in the process of integration? Yeah, well, it shows, you know, headcount is still very much one of the things executives are focused on. Um, and, and, you know, this is one of a series of cuts. I think, for me, the focus from our report and seems to be on the investment bank again. That makes a lot of sense, right? Management have been very clear. They're not particularly big fans of the investment bank they took on from Credit Suisse. Um, so, you know, it's, it's that sort of targeted look there. Um, though we do understand this may well sort of bleed across into wealth management uh, and also even the market side. But it's a good question. Sort of uh, back in last year, the chairman, Colm Kelleher, said, you know, the easy part of an integration is actually the job cuts. The hard part is what's coming in 2024, all these sort of technical mergers and all that sort yeah. of yeah. the real nuts and bolts of a massive merger. How does this stack up to other banks? Morgan Stanley, Barclays, for example, has been talking about layoffs as well. Is this just part of the trend? Yeah, I mean, certainly you look back at 2023, there are plenty of banks cutting, uh, and they're pretty, you know, it's a terrible year if you're a deal maker, basically. I think for me, what's interesting maybe about the timing is, is, you know, in the last few days, you've seen a few US banks come out and basically say, you know, deal making, we expect to come back. So, you know, that really helped Goldman's results. It really helped Morgan Stanley's results. So it's interesting, you know, it goes to show, I think, back to the strategy that UBS yeah. is doing. They're not trying to be, you know, a Goldman capital markets super yeah. focus. They're a wealth management firm. So are investors focused on these job cuts? Are they focused on whether they miss, up on the, miss out on the upside in IB? Or what are they focused on, Tom? I think for me it's something totally different. It is this sort of capital requirements that, you know, the Swiss government has sort of started to moot. So, you know, this was expected. You knew the politicians were going to be looking at this. But what came out recently was, you know, for me, quite a strident stance from the Swiss government that, that caught me by surprise. I thought it was you know, more aggressive than I thought. So we're understanding that that might be a 20 billion capital hit. So, you know, that puts everything else in the shade, right? It's a question of, you know, how do they sort of raise that money and does that impact stuff like buyout, buybacks or in other things? Tom, great stuff. Thanks for updating us. Tom Metcalf uh, joining us on what the latest is out from UBS. Up next, we'll get back to the monetary policy story. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Master says the Fed shouldn't be in a hurry to cut rates. We're going to get more on that story. Michael Gapen, Bank of America Global Research, is going to be joining us next. This is Bloomberg. In an environment where the geopolitical risk premium is high, 5 to $10 per barrel, if you don't get headlines with a materialization of the geopolitical risk, I think the path of least resistance for that premium is to drift, uh, drift lower. In our central case of no geopolitical uh, hits to supply, $90 per barrel should be uh, a ceiling on, on brand prices this year. The head of oil research over at Goldman Sachs, they're talking about $90 a barrel being maybe the peak that we get in oil prices at a time when some of their peers, say at J.P. Morgan, for example, saying 100 may be on the table. Not their base case, of course, but you're starting to see a little bit of a contrarian take there coming out of Goldman. 
be interesting to see kind of... It, it is premised on the idea that we don't get any more geopolitical tension. So that, yeah. I think, is probably the first thing that we need to kind of factor in. If it doesn't materialise, then maybe the oil price does go down. So I think we are all still on tenterhooks. I don't feel we've spoken about it since the weekend very much. Kind of what happens next? We're waiting to see what the Israelis are going to be doing. David Cameron, the British Foreign Secretary, was talking about this yesterday. He does expect a response. So I, I think the jury's still out very much on kind of what ultimately happens there. And if you do get a significant response, maybe it all does push kind of to the upper end. The, the GS argument is premised on nothing really happening. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's made clear, isn't it? On the, he, they talk about 5 or $10 being priced in for geopolitical risk still, yeah. and therefore why there might be some, some, uh, some uh, risk to the downside. Um, we are showing live pictures of uh, the European Leaders' Summit, which is currently taking place in Brussels. Enrico Letta, of course, uh, the, the Italian politician in charge of uh, coming up with a competitiveness uh, a briefing, I suppose, plan for today. We know Mario Draghi is working on a competitiveness report. Well, he's, uh, it's Enrico Letta who's currently uh, with... Charles Michel there of the European Council uh, talking about what's on the agenda at that meeting. I mean, dealing with energy challenges is part of what they're doing there in Brussels because the legacy of those, the reminder that we got of the vulnerabilities of the European economy when war started in Ukraine, Russia's war in Ukraine, um, you know, that's just one of a number of challenges, competitiveness challenges that Europe's dealing with right now. Yeah, and it's looking around the world and it's looking at China, it's looking at the United States, it's looking at what is being done in terms of fiscal policy, industrial policy and, and Europe finally is grasping the nettle. It's going to have to make some significant changes here. How does that happen? Is it joint issuance? How do we work uh, through an industrial policy on a sort of multi-country basis? I, I think so this summit actually feels more interesting in terms of what we're looking at here. And the compare and contrast across the Atlantic is the kind of the basis for this in terms of the, the outperformance we're seeing from the US economy right now. And, and how the Fed deals with that, I think, is, is a really live subject at the moment. We've seen yet another power pivot over the last few days, finally acknowledging the idea that the market's already graphed, that actually rate cuts are going to become more challenging from here. This is what Michelle Bowman had to say yesterday on this subject. We've seen over the past first few months of, um, of 2024, anyway, is that inflation, progress on inflation has slowed. And... and I expect maybe it's even stalled at this point. Okay. Stalled. So what do you do with that? It certainly doesn't feel like you're in a rate-cutting environment, does it? Let's get Michael Gapen's take on this. He is the head of U.S. economics at Bank of America Global Research. He's here in London. Nice to see you, Michael. Thanks for having me on. No landing. That feels increasingly like the scenario we're in, and that presumably means no rate cuts. At least for the time being, yes. I think the message you heard from Governor Bowman and the others is there's enough firmness in inflation that we don't have confidence to cut right now. Uh, so the view is you stay pat where you are and, yep. and, and look for more evidence. So, yes, I, I think you can argue that a no landing outlook, which is where we are, gives you enough firmness in inflation that rate cuts are, are delayed. So let's talk about a few weeks ago we were in a scenario where, and the, and the dots kind of back this up, that we were going to get three cuts this year and we we're going to get three cuts next year. Do I push that six, those six rate cuts, into next year, i.e. do we get none this year but get a lot next year, i.e. we're in a kind of no landing this year but a hard landing next year? So our, our view is that um, probably not, that what you would get is you get a shifting back of the start but you may get fewer cuts in, in total. Totality, okay. So we, we took... Uh, we slid from June to December on the, on the CPI data for the start, but we took both of those cuts out of the forecast. So we have a higher terminal at 350 to 375. So we think the message would be later cuts, but also policy over the forecast horizon the next three years. That needs to be tighter on average to get inflation where the Fed wants it to go. Mm. Good morning to you, Michael. Thanks for morning. coming to talk to us in London, bringing your, your U.S. experience very useful right now. D thinking about financial conditions and where they are at this point, do, do they feel too loose for the U.S. economy as it is at the moment? Do you think the Fed is going to want the market to tighten those conditions in some form to, to do its work for it so it doesn't have to deal with some of the more extreme scenarios? Yeah, I, think I think broadly that's right. We would say financial conditions are modest or maybe at most moderately restrictive. The policy rate may be well into restrictive territory. That may be accurate. But the broader set of financial conditions, mm. I think, is only modestly restrictive. So I think what you're getting from the Fed is a little bit of forward guidance action here. Later cuts, maybe fewer cuts on hold for longer. 
Um, but they still believe the supply side will keep the economy in a disinflation trend, and they see policy as, as restrictive. So the answer there is you just hold that restrictive policy for longer. But by changing your forward guidance, you do hope financial conditions tighten mm. and do that work for you, as opposed to having to come back and raise rates, which would be highly disruptive. And one way that they could tighten is by stocks falling, of course. And I wonder, right. your, your economics hat on, the, the, the wealth effect from stocks being as strong as they have been in the recent cycle, what, has that caught people by surprise, do you think? Well, I, I think the magnitude has caught people by surprise. Net wealth in the U.S. is up about $39 trillion since the onset of the pandemic. So asset markets as well as, as real estate valuations. And that has underpinned a very strong consumer, yes. So, I, you know, the, the wealth effect is still there. It works. I think what has surprised us all has just been the magnitude and the sheer size of that increase. It's about one and a half times of GDP. Where does the bond market fall into all of this? You've got $6 trillion sitting in money market funds, sitting in cash, driving inflation expectations in terms of the trade. How does that factor into the actual effect that a cut or a hike would have from the Federal Reserve? So in the sense that if you raise rates, it increases returns on savings balances? Yes. So I think in some ways, if you, if you raise short-term rates, it helps some savers. But it's going to depress activity elsewhere. So on, on net, you think it, it slows things down. But yes, the higher pool of cash savings, whether it's on household balance sheets or corporate balance sheets, right, makes it a little trickier to set your, your policy accurately. So but on, on net, you'd think higher rates would reduce activity, although you can't deny that some savers are, are benefited. But the yield picture is still much, much stronger, much, much higher. And I, I respect you're an economist, not a, a market strategist. Sure. But there is a dynamic in the market. There's a conversation in the market right now that because there is so much cash on the sidelines, specifically in money market funds, that the, the markets are actually driving some of the financial conditions, not just out of the stock market, but through the bond market, and has more of a direct effect and more of a near-term effect on the rates picture than the Federal Reserve has. Does that conversation have any merit to it? Yes, in the sense that the, what the Fed controls really is its real policy rate, right? So it controls the you know the overnight nominal rate and given where inflation is the real policy rate financial conditions broadly are determined by financial markets where where yields are where spreads are where the dollar is where equity equity markets are so and many things as you were just mentioning geopolitical risk moving oil markets right there's many factors that can move those financial conditions differently so the fed has influence but not sole influence on that so market expectations matter market views matter other risk factors matter. So when the markets fight the Fed, which is exactly what's happening mm -hmm. right now, one would argue, it feels like that they're more in charge of the interest rate picture. Markets are always in charge of the interest rate picture. More so than the Federal Reserve, though, controlling kind of the narrative more so than the Fed. Has the Fed lost well, the narrative I, then? No, I, I, think the, I think the Fed agrees with what the market is saying. I think the, the speakers that have come out from Jefferson to Bowman to Powell, I think all agree we all moved after the CPI data saying, I doubt that gives them comfort com and confidence, therefore they should delay. And the Fed came out and said, yeah, we, we agree we should delay. So I think right now the market and the Fed are on the same page. When the facts change. Until the facts change. Um, yeah, they, they, they feel like they have and, and continue to keep changing, which is making this so difficult to, to navigate right now. There's a lot of surprises in there. The Europeans feel like they're on a much more, in, in a very different place mm -hmm. right now. Bank of England yesterday, Bailey talking about rate cuts. He's got a confidence inflation that is coming down. You've got the ECB talking about a similar narrative. How far can they diverge? And because there is a, there is a kind of gravitational effect between both markets, both economies. Right. How, how far can they diverge, do you think? I, I, think they can, I think they can diverge, but I think the premise of your question is they can only diverge so far, yeah. and, and I would agree with that. So if, if the question is, if the Fed's delayed and, and we're... We don't really know when they're going to start. Can the ECB start in June? Yes. The question is how many cuts could they get in and how far they, they, can they go? And obviously the, how the currency moves will be a very strong influence on, on that decision. So my view would be, yes, you can get some divergence, but I would question how, how much. How much do you think? I, how, how many rate basis points? 75 yeah. basis 50, points? 50, 75 basis points. You could do that. Okay. Yeah, I think so.
Mm. That'd be about, I think, the limit of, of what you could do this year. OK, and that taps into what we were hearing from Andrew Bailey overnight, talking about how Europe is on a different trajectory in terms of the yep. data, the inflation data. Right. There's, um, there's a greater justification for cuts in Europe than there is in the US. I yes. would agree with that. And, he, and, and Bailey was referencing in particular a, a relative lack of demand-driven inflation in Europe and saying that that is still strong in the US. What, are you, right. what are you looking at when it comes to that demand-driven inflation in the US? What interests you at the sort of forefront of your research? Uh, Michael, about, about where that goes next, that, that demand-driven story. Yeah, that's the, so that's the interesting thing for me. I agree with... So the no-landing scenario is premised in part on this supply response, right? The labor force has rebounded. It's increased potential growth in the short run, which gives you higher actual growth, but still declining inflation. I agree with that, that narrative. The Fed has bought into it. But what I would say is I only push that so far because the story yeah. that starts with a rebound in the labor force, ends with greater employment, income, and spending. So what I would look at, honestly, is just when we're adding a few hundred thousand jobs a month, that's a tremendous growth in labor market income, which will ultimately lead to spending. It's not so easy to slice it and say, oh, this is all supply, and supply is going to do all the work for us. Yeah. So I would just say keep it simple. Look at income generation out of the labor market, and that will tell you where the demand side effect is in the U.S. Is the U.S. outperforming because of fiscal policy, and how does that fiscal policy change around the election, do you think? I think it's primarily outperforming from this labor market story. Okay. And then the secondary effect, which is still important, is, is the fiscal. Is fiscal. The, there's, an, there's a kind of immigration story, but, yeah. but the fiscal policy presumably is having an effect as well. You see it in the payroll data in terms of government spend, in terms of kind of what's happening with the labor market. Too. Well, most, most of that coming out of the labor market is at the state and local level and it's hiring yep. around education and health yep. so it has the same feeling of an economy that's still reopening from covid where employment and and education and health is still below pre-pandemic levels so i would qualify some of that under what we're calling you know the catch-up effect still in hiring um, and obviously you need a labor supply story to allow that to continue so i'd, I'd put that under the supply okay. but in terms of just fiscal contribution to, to growth. It's been very high in recent years. So, yes, I, I think it's been an important contributor, but maybe a secondary just, just before contributor. Before we wrap up, sure. the election, how does that change? Does that, how, how are you changing your models and your thinking in terms of how that election is going to affect? Well, I think that the question we all have to answer, and we don't obviously know it right now, is do yep. you get sweep outcomes? Yep. The, the risk, I think, that, that the market would point to is to say sweep outcomes... Uh, where you get an all-Republican outcome or an all-Democratic outcome, the feeling is that could be more fiscal expansionary. Okay. So you'd have to worry about maybe firmer demand, firmer inflation, fewer cuts in that world. But obviously, the, you know, the election in the U.S. is, is very close. I don't think mm. anybody has a good view on that. We're not here to predict it. So I think that's uncertainty we have to deal with later. But the risk is around those sweep outcomes. OK, and that would give more power to do things which might be fiscal. Michael, thank you very right. much. Thanks for joining us. Really good to speak to you. Michael Gapen, head of U.S. Economics at Bank of America Global Research, uh, passing through London and joining us here on set as he does so. Coming up on the programme, Europe is watching as industrial policy in China and the United States threatens to leave the continent behind. We're watching live pictures of EU leaders arriving for a summit in Brussels where they're talking about all of these really global challenges, taking on board some of the fiscal spend we were just talking about out of the United States and the policy environment around industrials there. We're seeing them arrive uh, right now. We'll be back to Brussels shortly for an update. This is Bloomberg. This is Markets Today. Uh, we are 47 minutes into our European trading session. We show some upside this morning, up by uh, around three-tenths of a percent on European stocks. Now, Europe is watching as industrial policy in China and the United States threatens to leave the continent behind. That's the backdrop for EU leaders meeting in Brussels today who face tough decisions on keeping the region competitive. Let's get more with Bloomberg's Oliver Crook, who's on the ground as we see these leaders arriving for these meetings. So you could say, Ollie, that alarm bells are ringing if you look at what's happening in China. It has been 
been for a long time, of course, and more recently in the United States. The European leaders, they're arriving now. Are they listening to what we're hearing from the U.S. and, and, and crafting a response accordingly? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you mentioned China, and China's an easy enough topic to address here in this forum, right, to say that there's overcapacity, to say how unfairly European companies are traded and that tariffs need to go on Chinese goods. That's easy enough. What's more difficult, Anna, is looking in the mirror and saying, how can Europe itself be more competitive? And looking in the mirror, they might see a familiar face, and that is one of Mario Draghi, who has been tasked with coming up with a report to how to make um, Europe more competitive. And maybe it's just my training, having been at Bloomberg for as long as I have. But when Mario Draghi speaks, we listen. And here's what he had to say about that. <laughs> China, for example, is aiming to capture and internalize all parts of the supply chain in green and advanced technologies. The United States, for its part, are using large-scale industrial policy to attract high-value domestic manufacturing capacity within their borders. We are lacking a strategy for how to keep pace in an increasing cutthroat race. It requires us to act as a European Union in a way we never have before. And so Mario Draghi, Mr. Whatever It Takes, what it takes today in Europe is radical change. He calls it a change that is comparable with the, really the founding of the union, the compact that uh, had to do with steel and coal 70 years ago by the founding fathers of the EU. Unfortunately for Europe, this is, tends to be the sort of thing that they are not great at, a massive change that is coming, one that takes a long time. There isn't the kind of urgency that it's tomorrow. It's really that slow walk towards economic obsolescence, which makes it very difficult to crack with political consensus here in Europe. So, Ali, walk us through what's actually on the table. When it comes to what these measures look like, what are we looking at? Right. So we're thinking about how to leverage uh, Europe's uh, sort of strengths. You know, it's not going to outspend the United States. It's not going to have a top-down economic uh, and industrial policy like China. They really need to leverage what Enrico Letta said, which he delivered a 147-page paper that now the EU leaders are discussing, is to leverage the single market. How do they do that? One is through uh, defense spending, and that is going to be through euro jo joint debt. That is what he has suggested. And, of course, the Capital Markets Union, which we've talked about for really almost a decade here in Europe. But could this give it the, the impetus? to get that money flowing across Europe, yes, for the defense industry, but for investment more broadly, that is the sort of money that needs to be tapped in Europe to get this stuff moving. We spoke to the defense chiefs yesterday who say, listen, we need stable and predictable and large investment in this industry if you really want to get the capacity up. And really, there's still a huge amount of debate. Where will the capital markets union be supervised? Will it be out of Paris? We know yeah. the joint debt is a massive question. And there's also one last thread here, Guy, is that basically you have this EU election and in individual member states, you have this rising sort of nationalism and Eurosceptical view. That is not going to make this any easier. Ollie, I feel like we've been talking about some of these subjects for a very long time. We generally do need a crisis to make progress. Is the crisis sufficient enough to make yeah. progress? And how far away from seeing that progress do you think we are? Listen, I think that there is a degree to which we could make some progress, certainly on the capital markets union. I mean, we heard Enrico Leto walk and we heard a couple of leaders saying that they were actually optimistic that we could make meaningful progress, even potentially today. I think that when you are faced with this, I mean, Olaf Scholz just returned a couple days ago from China. He touched down initially in a city of 32 million people, right? One that many Germans have never heard of. This is the sort of scale that Europe is facing now. And if they want to remain competitive, they need to figure out how to unleash it. The capital markets union seems to be potentially one that is the most within reach. Optimistic. When you hear the word optimistic coming out of Brussels, you do maybe pull a face. Uh, Ollie Crook, thank you very much indeed. We've heard a lot of optimism over the years. Ollie Crook in Brussels for us covering the summit. Plenty more still to come from him. We've got some great coverage also coming up out of Washington a little bit later on. IMF and World Bank spring meetings are taking place there. ECB governing council member Klaus Knott's going to be joining us. The South, South African Reserve Bank uh, Governor Lissette Kanyango is going to be joining us. Plus the IMF Managing Director Kristin Yagogieva uh, and Eurogroup uh, President Pascal Donahoe is, is going to be on Bloomberg a little bit later. It's a busy morning. It's a busy mm. day. 
coming out of DC. OK, I was about to go through a list of other things that are happening, but I think I'd just watch those. I think that I sounds... Think that's enough, isn't it? Sounds like a good thing to do. We do have some US data, of course, jobless claims, existing home sales. After hours, we'll also get numbers out from L'Oreal, so a bit of a focus on the consumer there. We had interesting conversations about what real wages do to the consumer, uh, consumer story with Tatiana Grail Castro earlier. Uh, but also uh, in focus, ECB's Mario Centino will be speaking more from Michelle Bowman. The Bank of England uh, Megan Green will be talking. We've had a lot from uh, Michelle Bowman and Megan Green recently, but we'll continue to bring you all of those latest uh, latest thoughts. I'll also add that we have Netflix earnings after the bell in the States. And yep. uh, the reason I really like Netflix in particular, yes, it's an American company. Yes, we all want to know when Bridgerton is coming out. That's my investment. Uh, <laughs> but it's also a currency story. So no, there's something, something in the past for you to think about. Yeah, so, so old school. <laughs> I refuse to... For a, for a bygone era. I refuse to steer into the skid. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're going to leave Critty alone on her 90s music Yes, taste. I'm going to go fine. lick my wounds after the show. Um, let's talk about the currency picture, though, because Netflix's yep. growth is more global now. It's hitting the emerging markets. It's hitting Asia. That's their next leg of growth. So the currency impact on the stock and what they do in terms of their currency commentary, to me, has always been kind of this weird mm. macro indicator that nobody really looks at yeah. from Netflix. Well, it's not one that's been on my radar, and you put it there, Chrissy. So now I will well, focus on that it. That and I always, I always do find, though, when you talk to CEOs about FX, they, well, you know, there are industries where you can try and take structural action to kind of match yep. exposures. But other than that, they just say, we try and look after the things that we can control and we can't really control that one, so yeah. we just leave it alone. But Netflix is everywhere, isn't it? So mm. presumably some of this is going to even itself out. Some currencies are strong, some currencies are weak. That's the natural hedge that you're talking about. Yeah. Unless... Yep. You are a predominantly dollar-based uh, dollar investor. investor. It's different, yep. for example, and you see this with McDonald's, you see this with Starbucks, and you yep. see this with Microsoft, for example, where so much of their business comes out externally. Netflix doesn't have that yet. They're still a majority U.S. company that is growing elsewhere. So if you have a subscription that's worth $13 in the States, hypothetically, yeah. it's worth far, it's priced far less than, say, India, for example, and that exchange rate ends up meaning a lot less revenue. Yeah. It takes us nicely into that real wages story as well, real wages for 2024. You know, yeah. if they're going to hold up, then that'll put less pressure on, on consumers to ask whether they really yep. need a million streaming services. There's a nice story. I think it's a Tarkoya they're talking about in the story this morning about how, how tags have got so much cheaper in Japan recently because the currency's been moving so fast that the retailers haven't caught up. Uh -huh. So there's an, op there's yeah. an arbitrage there's opportunity nice in luxury goods, potentially, <laughs> around some of this currency My trade. birthday's coming up, Guy. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. We're continuing to focus <laughs> please, on... Please don't open the door to me. Yeah, the, some of Rico to. jokes. Uh, oh we, got, uh, we, got, we, we took a deep dive into European politics earlier with Oliver yep. Crook, rightly, because we had... Uh, we, we've got uh, these your leaders still arriving for this event. I was told that uh, Olaf Scholz was just arriving, uh, but uh, he's disappeared from camera shot, so we can't show you that one. But he is arriving, and, and clearly a lot of pressure on Germany right now, because you've got all of these other leaders lining up to say, come on, this is something of a crisis, we need to uh, do something revolutionary. And what does that usually mean? That usually means uh, joint debt, and that's yeah. usually something the Germans are not fond of, fond of. But he's just come back from China? Yeah. What did he see he's there? He's seen the challenge, maybe. Maybe, he, maybe. maybe he's got kind of recent experience of the challenge. He's going to be briefing the other leaders on what he saw, what he heard in terms of what the Chinese are going to be doing. Um, that could be an interesting kind of change of heart, maybe, from, from his point of view. And he sounded... that The fear was that he would undermine the Europe, the kind of the tough European line. He didn't do that. He was actually fairly tough in terms of the language that he was using out there. Well, you've got Germany on board, hypothetically. Now you've got to co convince all of these smaller states that are worried that the bigger European countries have this advantage because the markets are relatively bigger. They're so worried about this U.S. competition. Yep. The real threat's from China. Do you have to convince some of the periphery still about the that? Still about the infighting, perhaps. Uh, that is it for markets today. Uh, we will leave you with plenty of programming coming out of the IMF. We just showed you some of the great guests that are coming up later on in our programming. Uh, European equity markets making modest gains up by three-tenths of one percent, reversing some of the losses in tech of yesterday. U.S. futures pointing a little higher. Have a good day, everybody. The Pulse is up next. This is Bloomberg.